Joining me now is former British Army officer, Colonel Richard Kemp. Colonel, very good evening to you. Welcome to uh, the Independent Republic. We've, we've slightly um, uh, sort of augmented it since you were last here. Uh, so uh, welcome and thanks very much indeed for joining us. Um, we've often made the argument here um, on this show and others uh, at Talk TV that uh, it's always a bad idea to kind of import foreign wars and import foreign differences between various different groups in various different countries. We seem to be doing that at a rate of knots now. Uh, we now apparently are faced with the possibility of Iranian dissidents living here, possibly coming under attack or possibly being attacked by officers or, you know, um, members of the Iranian government. Yeah, and that's been the case for a considerable time. When I was working in, um, in the intelligence world myself back in about 2005, it was well known that uh, Iran had uh, terrorist sleeper cells here in the UK as well as elsewhere in Europe with, you know, plans to carry out attacks against both dissidents and terrorist attacks against other UK targets as well. So you're right to be very concerned, but this is nothing, nothing really very new at all. It's been going on for a long time. Yes. But, I mean, knowing the area and the region as you do, I mean, clearly the Iranians are kind of ratcheting up the pressure to some extent. I mean, they're denying any involvement um, in some of the more recent attacks, including the drone attack on uh, the American um, uh, base, which killed three soldiers. But, I mean, there's an awful lot of money going out of Iran to fund all sorts of groups in all sorts of places, isn't there? Absolutely. Iran has a, a very extensive terrorist network all around the Middle East and in other countries as well. And they may deny it, but the reality is that uh, Iranian proxies were behind the attack on the Americans in Jordan. They, be, they were behind the attacks, the about 170 or so attacks on US forces in Iraq and Syria since uh, in the last three months. They're behind the attack on Israel on the 7th of October. They're behind the repeated attacks on Israel from Lebanon. That Iran has its hand on a vast terrorist network, which actually has been enhanced by funding released by the United States with British support from frozen assets originally held against uh, Iran's nuclear weapons program. But because the US, with again British support, has been so desperately keen to appease uh, the Iranians, um, it, it's actually encouraged them in doing this and therefore really uh, we have no one really but ourselves to blame for the situation we've got. And I also should have mentioned that Iran's hand is right behind the, uh, the Houthis' attacks on international shipping in the Red Sea as well. Yeah. And what do you think has emboldened them over the course of the last few months? Because there was a time when Iran would not have kind of reached out in the way that it seems to be doing. So what's changed? Well, I think, I think they are under pressure. Um, they've been doing this for a long time, but as you say, not perhaps as intensively, but they are under pressure because one of their major uh, proxies, Hamas in Gaza, and, and another proxy, Islamic Jihad in Gaza, is slowly being annihilated by Israel. And that, of course, is a big problem for, for Iran. At the same time, they're seeing uh, the potential for their major proxy, Hezbollah, being attacked by Israel uh, in southern Lebanon if they carry on their aggression against Israel. And they've seen the Western-led, the US-led coalition, which really consists only of the US and Britain, um, attacking their, their proxy, the Houthis, in the Red Sea. So they are. They are under pressure. They've got to show their strength. Um, and they need, to be, they need to be put firmly back in their boxes, which can be done with the right military action as well as sanctions by the US and, and its allies. Yeah. And we're hearing tonight that Joe Biden has made a decision about retaliation. Obviously, we don't know what it will be. We haven't um, been expecting to, to be told that. But what would you think the options are for the US? Well, I think we, what we've seen is in response to the, as I said, about 170 or so attacks against US forces in Iraq and Syria, we've only really seen small inadequate um, retaliatory attacks in some cases by America on, on Iranian proxies. We've also seen the ineffectiveness of US and UK attacks on Houthi, their Houthi proxies in the Red Sea. That They don't respond to this kind of attack. Iran needs to be attacked itself. It needs to have the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, an element of the Iranian state which is responsible for organising all these proxies, 
that they need to be subject to a significant attack by the US. And that will result in, uh, in Iran drawing its horns in, at least to some extent. Yeah. People say, oh, that is escalation, it leads to World War III. Nothing of the sort. If you recall, when President Trump uh, ordered the assassination of Qasim Soleimani, the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force, who was in charge of all this in his day, um, when that was uh, carried out, the, there were people saying, oh, there's going to be massive retaliation by Iran. What did Iran do? It did nothing. Right. It, it basically drew its horns in and sat back and did virtually nothing in response. I think, you know, there's only one language that Iran understands, and that's the language of force and military strength. If they're not given that, then they will push further and further until they are, and therefore it's long overdue for an attack directly against the IRGC. And are you one of those who believes that the whole business of October the 7th was cooked up by Hamas at the behest of Iran because they wanted to try and screw up the deals that were being done between Israel and Saudi Arabia, um, the Abraham Accords and, and the kind of the newfound cooperation, shall we say, between uh, parts of the UAE and Israel as well? I'm certain that the attacks were planned, trained, equipped, funded and orchestrated by Iran. There's, there can be no question about that. The Hamas could not have done this on its own. It had to have um, certainly very significant support from Iran. And, and all you have to do is to look at the action of the Hamas fighters inside Israel on the 7th of October and see how they operated. These were not some ragtag terrorist bunch from Gaza just firing blindly in the air with their AK-47s as they're in their, their habit, they, they have a habit of doing. These were a well-trained, almost military organization, communicating with each other, operating as teams. These were trained by professionals, and the IRGC and Hezbollah as well, another agent of the IRGC who is involved in training Hamas, they're, they're very effective terrorists, and it would have taken that for them to do it. I think the timing of the attack was related to the progress being made in normalization of relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia. It may also have been connected to uh, Iran's judgment of, um, of, of Israeli weakness. They saw the division in Israeli society around the judicial reforms that had been outfolding for many, many months before that. And also they saw a distancing between the White House and Israel with Joe Biden refusing to invite uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to the White House. And they thought perhaps this is the time now to act with a weak, divided Israel, un un unhelpful progress with Saudi Arabia and um, a US that may not come to the aid of Israel. They, they miscalculated on, on both of those factors for sure. And they also miscalculated on Saudi Arabia because Saudi has been saying recently that they are willing to go ahead with normalization after this conflict is finished. And as far as um, what's actually happening in Gaza is concerned, I know you've been spending quite a bit of time in Israel with the IDF recently. Um, how much damage has Israel done to Hamas? How much is left to do, I suppose, would be my question. I know Net Benjamin yeah. Netanyahu told Douglas Murray here on Talk TV yesterday uh, this could take months. But, I mean, realistically, what, what, how, how much damage have they done so far? Yeah, I spent three months in Israel since the start of this war. I left about just over a week ago now. I went into Gaza a few times and I observed the IDF in action on the ground in Gaza, uh, as well as from the air. And um, the, I think the, the reality is that certainly the Israeli defence minister says that uh, the IDF have effectively destroyed 50% of Hamas's fighting capability in manpower terms. Mm. And he, he said that they've, they've killed a quarter of Hamas fighters and they've seriously wounded another quarter. And I think those seriously wounded are people who cannot return to battle. So effectively taking out half of Hamas's strength, that is a very, very severe blow to Hamas. Mm. In addition, they've destroyed large numbers of their tunnel infrastructure. They've destroyed vast quantities of munitions. And Hamas is now at the stage where it cannot operate as a unified body. It still has a command structure in certain parts of the Gaza Strip, but it's not able to function as a as a, a, a fully-fledged organisation as it did at the start. So I think um, that needs to continue. It's not, not by, it's far from over. And that destruction needs to continue until maybe a tipping point's reached at which Hamas collapses, even short of uh, the destruction of the whole organisation. Mm. 
for the length of time it might take. I've been, it's been estimated to me by IDF generals that we could be talking about a matter of a few weeks um, before the current intensity of fighting ends. Then after that, once fighting has maybe largely dissipated and, and the IDF uh, is focused more on clear, clearing up operations in, in Gaza, tracking down terrorists that have escaped, destroying tunnels, destroying infrastructure, that could take many more months after that. But I think we, we're likely potentially to see the end of this severe phase of conflict within a, a matter of weeks. What that means, I don't know whether it's two weeks, three weeks, it is hard to say, maybe a bit more. OK. Colonel Kemp, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us. Colonel Richard Kemp there, uh, giving us the benefit of his experience in Gaza 